Yeah, I don't have time to go into this on the Zohar. It's kind of a cool thing. Too bad. I'll leave it there if anybody wants to take a screenshot. I don't usually do Zohar stuff, but I thought this was interesting. Anyway. I don't want to keep you forever, so we're not going to do it. Some people are missing. Jasper asks, what do you call any service given to the Lord and for the Lord? Avodah. Avodah, Jasper, means service. Yeah, service for the Lord, avodah. And that word is from the word that means to worship, as in to serve. So in Hebrew, the concept of worship, it can't be separated from service, right? So when, when Yehoshua, when Joshua says, choose this day whom you shall serve, it's this verb, right? Whom you will avad. Right? Avadta, whom you will avad, used to be ah, ah, I am avad, avad, <laughs> like that, whom you will serve. So the act of serving with one's life is actually a life of worship, right? So the Levites, for the Levites, the avodah, it included when they're walking up, we're told the Talmud that when they'd walk up the steps, also Josephus mentions this also in his histories of Israel, when, when, you walk, when they would walk up the steps of the temple, on each step they would recite a different psalm in Hebrew. Right? They're worshiping Hashem. That's part of the Avodah, the service. And also, when the Levites were carrying the heavy pieces of the tent or whatever, right? They're breaking down the tabernacle, and they're putting it on carts, and they're pulling it and carrying it, and digging holes for the tent pieces to go in and all that stuff, and they're pulling the strings tight and hammering the pegs in the ground. That's also Avodah. They're both Avodah. It's not a separate concept in Hebrew. Worship and service, it's the same thing. You see? And it's because the Western concept of worship, it's a false dichotomy. It's separated, right? So people will be like, oh, I love praise and worship. I love worship. I love... Do you really love worship? <laughs> How come nobody has volunteered to help go through my videos to find the time codes that I needed so we can serve more people, make it easier to search for stuff? You, know? you really love Avodah? I don't think so. I don't think everybody loves Avodah. Not everybody wants to give their time to do stuff, right? That is worship. That's a great question you asked, Jasper. That is Avodah. Avodah. Avoda. And yeah, <laughs> there's that connection, right? Yeah, and when it's in context of of it of God, yeah, then it's true worship, right? It's truly serving him. And this is the word that is in Greek, Latoeo, that we never see used for Yeshua. You never see it in concept of Yeshua. We worship the Father. We don't worship the Son. We praise the Father, we don't praise the Son. We pray to the Father, we do not pray to the Son. Dr. DeVere shares, then Yeshua said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall not proskuneo, uh, you shall proskuneo the Lord your God and serve him only. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, so that, that's a great example where we have the Hebrew parallelism clarifying what Mishtachave means in that case. Right? So really, literally he's saying, you shall prostrate down before the Lord your God and serve him only, right? But because of the presence of Av Avad there, we understand it's in the concept of liturgy, right? Like worship, like in the temple. Great example. That's Matthew 4, verse 10, shared by Dr. Vera. Thank you for that. Excellent. Mm. Any other comments or questions? Good. All right, verse 20. Va'atta, so now, lehu, v'nahanagehu, let us, okay, go and let us slay him. And let us cast him out. Oh, pardon me, cast him. In one of the Habibot, one of the cisterns, the Amarnu. And we will say, a, uh, Literally, it says an evil animal ate him. But this is just how, this is something I was talking with my students a while back. I was explaining that the word evil, evil, <laughs> that's Dr. Evil, evil in Hebrew, doesn't always mean evil in English, right? It means bad. It's bad, right? So for us, for example, the Satan is evil, right? Because it's bad for us, right? Not really evil, but it's bad for us, right? To be tested by this diabolical genius, right? <laughs> you don't want that to happen, right? And so when a bad thing happens, uh, something that's harmful to humans, the Torah explains that as Ra'ah. So it's not that the Chaya, the animal, is evil. Right? So that's why we usually render this in English as a wild animal, like a dangerous animal, a lion or a bear or 
something like this, right? So it's interesting to understand that this is, because some people, they get caught up. I think the discussion we were having a few weeks ago was an evil spirit from the Lord, right, went to King Shaul. And some people get caught up on this reading in English. What? Evil spirits are doing what God says to do? I mean, they're, okay, yeah, he could force them. But this is a spirit that served God, right? And so what it means is it's bad for the victim, right? It's bad for Shaul to have this spirit around him, making him crazy, whispering things to him, right? It doesn't mean that the spirit was, you understand? The, the Ruach Ra'ah, it's just like the Chaya Ra'ah, like the, the evil animal, right? The animal's not evil. It, it's not like rebelling against God or something like this. It's doing what it was programmed to do genetically, right? It's it's hungry and it's going to attack, right? This concept of, a, of an evil animal, right? This is just how Hebrew thinks about evil. It's not like in English. When we say evil today, oh, right, we had a chat about this also in the Messianic chat. You know, when we say evil today, we think like morally bad, right, is what it means. That's the English. So you can't always one-to-one map a Hebrew word or an English word. That's why it's really good to have samplings. Scripture here, scripture there, scripture there, scripture there. And, and okay, you get the full picture of the word. All right. What this means is in context of being against God, it does mean evil like in English. But in context of in relation to humans, it just means like bad for us. It's bad for us, right? Like even in Egyptian, they did this the same way. In ancient Egypt, they if a word de- denoted something that's bad for people, they put a little bird at the, at the end, sometimes multiple little birds that you wouldn't read. And the little bird was like a symbol that meant this is generally bad, right? And the idea is that birds eat crops, you know, something like that. So that's why. And so the word evil in Egyptian has the little bird after it. Not saying that the bird is evil, but it's like it's bad. In that case, it extends even to be bad, like to the gods or whatever. Yeah, nice. Uh, Dr. Vera comments, regarding the prayer to Yeshua, what did he mean by if you ask me anything? Okay, Dr. Bear says, what do you mean by if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it from John 14, 14. So that's a mis, either a mistranslation or a, a wrong paraphrase. He doesn't say if you ask me, like you wrote there on the screen, anything in my name. He says, if you ask the Father, if you ask God, anything you ask in my name. You see, it doesn't mean, and you'll notice that when he tells us how to pray, he says, when you pray, pray like this, Avinu, our Father. He doesn't pray, say, when you pray like this, pray Yeshua Tenu, our Yeshua, right? He didn't say pray to me. He doesn't say ask me. He never says ask me. So maybe maybe misquoted that there, or it's a bad copy, or the translation could just be bad. You know, if you like, if we have time afterwards, I can pull up in the Greek and I'll demonstrate that it does not say if you ask me. He doesn't say if you ask me. He says if you ask the Father, if you ask God, in my name, right? So in my name means what we would say bischut Yeshua in Hebrew by the merit, by his merit, or by his reputation, right? So it doesn't mean like you have to legalistically at the end of every prayer, right? Right? So they even say a normal bracha, like right? Before you drink water. Right? In the name of Yeshua and Messiah. So this just shows a surface level knowledge of Hebrew when people feel they gotta do that, right? When you say to do something in his name, it means you come in his authority. We come in his authority. We come by means of of his reputation, right? Because we belong to him. We are part of his flock, part of his fold. That's coming in his name. You don't have to say mechanically in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, right? That, that's legalistic, right? That's, that's not, and that's not what the text means. So he's saying, if you're mine, if you belong to my fold, you recognize me as your king, then anything that's the father will be given to you, right? Because you are the ones who know my name. I, you know about my fame. You know about my deeds, right? Like our Jewish brothers and sisters who don't believe in Yeshua, they don't know him, right? They don't know his name. You could say in Hebrew, they don't know his name. And you might come back and say, wait, what do you mean they don't know his name? Jeremiah, they know, they know his name is Yeshua Hanotru, right? You know, Yeshua from Nazareth. That's what it means. It's deeper, right? So all the places where God says, like, they know my name, right? It means we know him. We know all of his mighty deeds. So we, followers, those of the testimony of Yeshua, we know his deeds. We know he rose from the dead. We, you know, the Father rose him from the dead. We knew he healed the sick. We know that he rose other people from the dead. We know that he had these powers. And because he had these amazing powers from on high, from on God, he was who he claimed to be. And that even death could not keep him down. Right. So we know his name, what that means. Okay. So when we ask in his name, it just means we're the ones who know him. We're part of his fold. We observe his interpretation of the Torah. Yeah, nice question. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, remind me, if I don't get to it at the end today, Doc, then I uh, just ask me in the chat, the Messianic chat. I'll be happy to revisit that, John 14, 14. Yeah, okay. All right, so they're going to say a wild beast ate him. Then we'll see what happens with his dreams. Then it will be seen, yeah. Verse 21, by Reuben, but Reuben, when Reuben heard, but Yatzilehu saved him, the Adam, from their hands, meaning from their power. By all that, he said, we shall not strike. Okay, this is idiomatic. It literally says we will not strike a soul. We will not strike a life force. That means we're not going to murder, right? Verse 22, by him, and he said unto them, who's the he? Reuben. So Reuben said to them, don't spill blood. Hashlichuoto, cast him el habor haze unto this pit, asher badid bamidbar, which is in the wilderness. Probably means desert in this case, right? So he's he's adding that extra point to say, look, he's not even on water. The yad al tishlochuba, but don't raise a hand to him. A hand. It's special emphasis. It's put before the verb. Don't raise against him. Leman hatzil. Okay, he's not talking anymore. So that he might rescue or snatch oto him up miadam from their hands. The Hashivo, in order to return him, El Aviv, to his father. So Reuben's actually being quite a good guy here, right? I think this is further confirmation that he didn't really sleep with his father's concubine, that it really was moving the bed like we talked about last time, right? Because we get this demonstration from the text. He's a good guy, right? Verse 23. ba Yosef el So it happened, but it happened that when Yosef came unto his brothers, Vayafshi too, that they stripped at Yosef. Yosef et Kutonto, his uh, tunic, et ketonet tapasim, the long armed, the long sleeve tunic, asher Allah, which was on him. Verse 24. And they took him, and they cast oto him, habora, towards the pit. The habor grek, ein bomayim, and the pit was empty, or the system was empty, there was not any water in it. By the way, this first part was Shimon, it was probably Shimon. Levi or, pardon me, it's probably Levi or Shimon who made this statement up here. That let's go and let's slay him, right? I think this is my opinion because I think they probably had a propensity to violence after what happened in Shechem. Think about it. They slaughtered all those guys, right? Violence has a way of desensitizing people to violence. So I think it's probably, and since tradition tells us Shimon was the ringleader, I think probably it's Shimon or Levi. So probably Shimon who's saying this statement up here in black. Let's slay him, right? They're just ready to kill as a solution. Yeah, and here we have here's here's one of the one of the evidences for the tradition that it was Shimon. From the testament of Shimon to chapter two, verse eleven to thirteen, and the testament of Reuben, chapter one, verse seven. These are second temple literature writings, right? Jewish writings. Of course, not really these guys wrote it down and you know, it's tradition. But it was Shimon the ringleader, right? He's the one who wanted to do this. Yeah. And he was furious for three months at Yehuda. For stopping him from killing Yosef, right? Hashem then punished him with a half-withered hand, and later Shimon repents. That's why Shimon, when Yosef Atzidik selects him out to be the one that stays prisoner, right? <laughs> the first time, he doesn't protest because he knows he was guilty. He is the one who got his brothers all riled up with the phrase, diabolical plan. Not only to do that, but then to to misrepresent that an animal actually killed him to the father. Verse 25. So then they sat down, and this is interesting because our Torah portion starts with Yaakov. And now we have So now we have they are sitting down to eat lechem bread. Right? So the first one is a righteous Yeshiv sitting in the land of Israel, right? He's coming to fulfillment. He's accepted in the name of Israel, and he is living up to his destiny by now dwelling in the land of Canaan, right? Living out the birth, right? And now we have a wicked Vayishivu here, in contrast to that, that they sat down to eat bread. Vayishivu, and they lifted up Einehem, their eyes, Vayiru, and they saw, Vahine, behold, Orchat Yishma'ilim, a caravan. The root of this is the word Orach, right? Like the Orachayim, right? The path of the righteous. So those who are traveling on the path, it's an orcha. So it can mean a path, 
or it can mean an actual caravan. In this case, caravan, the feminine one. A caravan of Yishmaelites, Ba'a, were coming. Migila, coming up from Gilead. Ugamalehem, and this is kind of ironic. Gilead, where we have the, the testimony that Laban and his offspring won't do anything to hurt Jacob and his offspring, but Jacob's own offspring are hurting his offspring. I think that's in there as a point of irony for us. But they're coming up from Gilead. Okay, thanks. Uh, Doc checked. He says that other versions, they delete the, the me, like praying to me. Okay. Ugam alayhem, and their camels, Nosi'im, were carrying. Nechot, Utsoi, Valot, they're carrying like a laudanum gum, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, balm, and, uh, and, and citrus gum, Holachim, the whole read, they're they're going to descend down to Mitzrayim, Egypt. Okay, let's get the, there's those meanings, and what's interesting by it, because it tells us about this, what they're carrying, the text is telling us this why. It's telling us what they're carrying. Notice it doesn't say they were carrying Avadim; they were not carrying slaves. So this is another tragedy of this because what happens? Our ancestors, well, some of them are ancestors, not all, right? The sons of Israel. They're taking people with an honest trade of spices and we're making them Yishmaelites. Yishmael is on a lower level than Israel, right? And so this is showing how wicked the act was. We're taking people who are also sons of Abraham, right? And we're supposed to be the chosen ones. And we're turning them into slave traders. Who knows? Maybe they kept trading slaves after that because they realized, wow, this is more profitable than stupid gum. And they walked themselves, right? It's just tragedy. But we that, are, that this happened to these guys. But Yehuda said to his brothers, What is the What is the beitza? What is the, what is the, the prophet? Usually this is a negative word for prophet. Ill gotten gain, right? We see it in the Proverbs, right? And so notice the beitza, this is influencing the Orchat Ishmaelim, right? We're getting them to be part of the beitza. Beitza is usually like gain that the thief gets, right? Or gain that the murderer gets. So it's very interesting to me that this is the word that Yehuda used. Maybe he's using this word even intentionally to try to get them to repent from the action and not do it already, right? But, uh, yeah. What's the ill gotten gain? That's what he's saying. What's the ill gotten gain? That we should slay Ed Achino, our brother, the Chisino Ed Damo, and cover up his blood. Hmm. I really wanted to talk about this, but we're already an hour 46 minutes in. I'm worried to the time. It's here, if you're interested. This is Proverbs, uh, Mishlei chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. And we're seeing Beitza, right? I'm, I linked to this from the idea of Beitza, right? Yeah, I don't think we have time to go through. This will take five minutes at least, maybe more, maybe ten. Okay, but there it is, if you're interested. Maybe I'll do a separate teaching on that. Let's see the ill gotten gain. Okay. And there's a play on words also. Batsa betsa means to cut the thread of life. So it can either mean ill gotten gain or to cut the thread of life, right? So you see why this is a negative, right? It can at least show you the main thrust from this point from the proverb. You can read the proverb on your own if you like. Mishle is awesome in Hebrew, just awesome. All right. Uh, yeah, I am thinking I'm going to skip this also. The proverb then links into the Mayim Chaim, because of the bubbling up of the spirit. That's the phrase that's used in the proverb, and it links. Basically, this is the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 7 to 14. This is my translation. Yeah, we'll just read my translation, but we won't talk about it, okay? So a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Yeshua said to her, give me to drink. For his Tamidim had gone to the city in order to buy food. The Samaritan woman says to him, how do you, being a Judean, ask to me to drink for me, who am a Samaritan woman? Judeans do not associate with Samaritans. Yeshua answered her and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who is the one saying to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you Mayim Chayim, spring water. She says to him, Oh, mister, you do not have a bucket, and the well is deep. From where then do you have the spring water? Are you not greater than Yaakov Avinu, who gave us this well, and who himself drank from it, and his sons and his livestock? Yeshua answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks from this water 
will get thirsty again. But one who drinks from the water, which I myself will give him, will certainly not thirst throughout eternity. Because the water which I will give to him shall become in him a spring forcing upwards in life eternal. So that's my translation from the Greek there. And the reason I connected this to the proverb we read was the proverb talks about bubbling up within them, right? It's the same kind of language that came from the Hebrew into the Greek here. So I think there's a Gezer Shava there. There's a connection between these portions. But we don't have time to tease that out too much. But there it is. Maybe it'll you have a thought or something useful from that. Parallel in words of Mashiach. So I want to read to you from Matthew 7, verse 1 through 6. This is ESV's translation. Judge not that you be not judged. How many times have you heard that from the coin? <laughs> For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? Do not you notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, right? <laughs> When you will see very clearly, and then you will see clearly, take this, I'm sorry, uh, sorry. When there is a log in, in your own eye, verse 5, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Number 6, do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you too. And you have to understand, dogs was a, was a uh, pejorative used by first century Jews to mean Gentiles, those who do not follow the way, right? So this is some good advice, of course, from Messiah. We're going we're gonna to tie this in in a moment. Sorry, I'm speeding up a little bit because I lingered a bit longer than I should have on the other parts. Ideally, I'm trying to make these draw show in an hour, 45 minutes or less. Right? But sometimes it's there's such good stuff in here, you know, and the spirit takes us in conversation. So hope you guys don't mind that we might be getting close to two hours. You'll be out way before seven, okay? A note on keeping silent. So I'm giving these apostolic writings as they, I believe they're in parallel to what we learn, what we're observing in the misdeeds from the righteous, later to be known as the righteous Yosef, but the way he acted with his brothers, right? First Thessalonians, this letter says, for, what, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly. King James is really funny. King James says, study to be quiet. <laughs> so you, got, you got like piles of books. Oh, how, how can I be quiet? You know, there's got to be some way to be quiet. <laughs> it's like, you know, so to study to be quiet, right? So aspire to live quietly. And to mind your own affairs. By the way, there's another reason what's bad to read the King James, right? Because the English has different meanings than it is today. Even if the translation were perfect, it's, you know, centuries old. Language has changed. And work with your hands as we instructed you. Okay, so this part here I thought was interesting. That we should try to live quiet lives. The greatest among you. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. I guess that's a baboon. <laughs> Matthew 23, verse 11. The greatest among you shall serve, shall be the shall be your servant. Right? You shall serve the others. So let's tie these apostolic writings together with what we had in the part of the Torah portion that we covered. Of course, we didn't finish it. In the end, he's we're almost there. He's sold into slavery, right? You know, and then then our father Yaakov, Yaakov he uh, he he continues to mourn forever, basically. And he says, I'll go down to the grave mourning for my son, right? So just a terrible thing. So how, hey, this is supposed to be animated. What happened? <laughs> Oops. How we got here, learning from past paths. Number one, this is the takeaway for today, guys. So if you slept all time, focus in now. We're going to tie the apostolic writings and the Gezer Shavot you know, together with what we had in the Torah portion, all right? So Yosef's Ziba, his evil evil report what can we learn from this right that he brought back he did Lashon Hara against his brothers use care when judging others right this is the issue is teaching about judge not right when we judge others the danger is if it's something that we've been guilty of as well right so it's not saying that you don't judge something as sinful right you know they're going they love to throw this on our face right you know 
or or those even who aren't going but they don't follow Yeshua. You're not supposed to judge, right? You're not supposed to judge. Yeah. That's one thing I learned about you guys. You Bible believers don't judge. It's like talk about it. get some context, man. <laughs> what it's saying is, if someone is doing a sin that you also do, right? Be careful how you judge them, right? Or that you have done, you're guilty of doing, right? Be careful in your judgment then. Have some mercy, right? Have some, have some leniency. Because if you come down hard on them, like a hypocrite, well, what do we see that Yeshua hates more than anything? Hypocrisy, right? If you come down hard on them as a hypocrite, then you're going to get it too. It's going to happen to you. So be careful. Yosef could have had a healthy dose of this and reported things a bit more positively to his father when reporting on his brothers, picking on the sons of his Pilgashim. Number two. Sorry, supposed to be animated one time so you don't get overwhelmed. Yosef's tunic. Okay. So he's given this tunic, the ketonet, and he wears it in front of his brothers. How else could he have handled that? Often he wasn't off shepherding with him. He was at home, right, with the father. Why not just wear it on those days? Why not change when he went out? Right? There's ways to do this. There's ways to behave, to behave with, in the South we say, with kuth, right? He could have shown some kuth, right? So, and if his father said, why aren't you wearing your tunic? He'd say, oh, you know, well, we don't want something to happen to it. It might get dirty. I go to check on my brothers, right? You see, there's ways he could have kept it, like his inside clothes, right? His cherished inside clothes. But instead, he wears it openly in front of his brothers, right? So I think this is symbolic of sharing all of our successes with the world, Sometimes we need to hide it away, right? And this is Yeshua commenting about casting your pearls before swine, right? Be careful what you decide to share with other people. Your successes, your newfound faith, if you're new to the Torah movement, right? Uh, your, your, the wonderful treasures of the holidays that you love. Be careful who you share it to, right? Be careful who you wear your ketonets pasim in front of. Right? Maybe it's not appropriate for them to see. You got a raise at work. Maybe you don't tell everybody about your raise at work. I remember when I used to have, uh, I used to be a software architect and, you know, oh, can I tell this anything? Okay. I had some close family members that I like to tell whenever I got a new job because, you know, Hashem was blessing me and each job was double the salary of the previous job and the next job, wow, double again. You know, I was, I was excited and I wanted them to be excited for me, right? And foolishly, in my youth, I would tell them about it, right? And, you know, those who know me know that I'm not all about the money, right? But to me, it was a sign of, look how God's blessing me. Look, isn't this amazing, right? Like, I never thought that this was possible, right, to get those kind of salaries. And so I was sharing it because I thought they also would be happy for me for being successful. And every time I'd share about a new job, and guess what it pays? And I'd say the pay, and they'd say, there's more important things than money. As if I didn't know this, right? Like, just, what? I know. I just want you to be happy for me, to see how God's blessing me. And, and so that was my mistake, right? I shouldn't have kept that to myself, right? And so it's not just about sharing your love of Torah to other people. It's also about your successes. That sometimes it's best not to put that on Facebook in front of the world and show how well you've done. And we have, we have a whole other teaching about the eye and the the evil eye and the dangers to you. By doing that but even apart from the dangers just as far as alienating folks it's worth keeping to yourself without even getting into the whole evil eye philosophy dr Devere shares that yosef has some arrogance and no self-assured assurance and that may be the reason that he was brought to egypt to perfect his character yeah well put well put yeah you know, our Heavenly Father loves to discipline us, doesn't he? He loves to chastise us. Right? And the wise person would be careful to avoid putting God in a position that he has to chastise us. Right? Let him bless us. Let him let the let the blessings come our way. But don't flaunt your blessings. Yeah? And don't be arrogant about it. That won't happen to me and blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. And the way that we judge others when we've done the same thing ourselves this is also an aspect of the same thing, right? Maybe you're in a better place now and you don't sin in the same way that your brother or sister is sinning now, but you used to. You used to, right? And so we have to have mercy in our judgment in those cases.
Good. Yosef's dreams. Well, this is an expansion, I think, from era number two. The same personality, the same bad midot that at that time Yosef had, that, like Dr. Vera said, God had to cause him to be developed by humbling him in Egypt. Those same negative midot also caused him to flaunt his dreams. The dream was for him, right? It wasn't for his brothers. When God sends a prophetic dream to you, it doesn't mean that you're a prophet, that you have to go and, and if you are a prophet, a prophet has an audience, right? A certain people he's supposed to share it with. In the case of Yosef, he never was called to prophesy this. It was for later, so he would understand that God has given him this gift, and that would then feed him into him being elevated to be basically the king of all of Egypt, the viceroy of all of Egypt. So it was a mistake, and as Chizkuni said, he really wanted to hurt his brothers. It gives us a glimpse of the kind of spoiled brat that he was at age 17. And this actually, I think, is why we're told that he was, he's 17, but he was still a, a youth. In those days, most 17-year-olds were already mature, but he was still a youth, right? He still acted like a kid. I've met 40-year-olds that act like kids, right? Some people, they always, I think that's why the Torah adds that, still a youth. Remember the question from a barman all about it? Number four, we need to learn to show humility. This is what Yeshua the Messiah means when he says the greatest among you are to be the servant of the others, right? When, when any of you are called with the opportunity to serve our community, do your best. Put your time into it, right? Do the best that you can to help build up the community because in doing that, you are serving our God and Father. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, Rabbi. Make sure to fill out the sheet that Naomi shared, huh? So I know those of you who are going to be in the Revelation class Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Hey, you made it to the end of this part of the Drash. Mazel tov. Watch the next one. Please remember to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you like the content. Donations may be sent to patreon.com slash Hebrew literacy. And as always, kol kavod ladonai, all glory 